Great. Um, well, thank you for that introduction. As Barry said, I'm um, with the City of Orlando. I'm a project manager with the City's Office of Sustainability and Resilience, um, which was established under our Mayor Dyer's Green Works Initiative um, that's really focusing on environmental stewardship, social justice, and economic development and the intersection um, of those three fundamental areas so we can preserve and protect our natural resources and environment for years to come. To give you a little bit of a window into Orlando, because I know folks are tuning in largely from California, but all over, um, we're a medium-sized city. Um, this, uh, these numbers are from pre-pandemic, so these are the, the latest that we have, but we know that um, population is growing and tourism is coming back, um, which is a significant consideration for our city. Um, we had over 75 million visitors in 2019, so um, considerable impact when you're thinking about the, the transient population that, that passes through our city and, and is contributing to the various um, resource consumption across. Um, but one, one quick note, um, most consider Disney World um, and, and everything that lies therein as part of Orlando, which it is in a very, very general sense, um, but they are not within the specific footprint of our municipality. So we have um, just over 200 city buildings that we manage, um, many more that are citywide, but Cinderella's Castle is not one of them. And when we're looking at our built environment, I won't belabor all of the, um, the nuances of our greenhouse gas inventory, but um, the, the large sum of it is our buildings. Over 80% um, of the city of Orlando's greenhouse gas emissions is embedded in our built environment. Um, and the approach that we have taken both in setting our goals and then the initiatives that we've implemented to strive towards meeting them um, really is looking at that sort of uh, hierarchy of the foundational conservation and efficiency work um, and then renewable energy and how we're powering our buildings coming after we've seized all of those opportunities to use less and use better. Um, we do have a benchmarking policy here in place. Uh, all those details, I can talk more offline with folks or can be found on our website. Um, we passed this a few years ago. It took effect in 2017 and um, impacts all city buildings that are 10,000 square feet or larger um, and any private buildings that are 50,000 square feet or larger and just requires that annual reporting of energy consumption. Um, water consumption is encouraged. Ours currently does not have a penalty of fee associated with non compliance, um, but it is encouraging that um, that annual reporting to, to engage more with that information um, and make decisions for building improvements accordingly. Um, and as we've embarked down this path of what next, how do we drive um, deeper impact in terms of um, reducing emissions and, and enhancing the efficiency and performance of our buildings, um, we've really kind of taken a, a hard look at specifically what the energy burden landscape looks like here and what that should mean for key policy and program considerations. Um, to, so to provide some kind of broad context, um, here's some information from the Energy Information Administration. Um, one in three households faced challenges in energy bills in 2015. Um, and again, there's always sometimes a lag in some of these studies and these data sets. And so um, we know that the costs of energy have been rising um, all over, um, both the cost of fuel and other sources. We're in a, in a moment of kind of record inflation um, and coming, coming out or still within, but in a different stage of a global pandemic. So all of these things have only exacerbated some of these financial strains and stressors. Um, and when looking at that specifically from a race perspective, the data is clear that energy insecurity is linked to race and communities of color um, are more likely to be impacted and facing high to severe levels of energy burden across the country. And particularly here in the Southeast, um, while it's somewhat commonly known that we have some of the lowest utility rates generally in the country, um, we're also known for having some of the highest energy bills. Um, and we're continuing to see those costs increase um, even, even locally here, our utility has recently had to raise those rates due to the rising costs of fuel and all of these other things globally that are then impacting um, what that, that landscape looks like here locally. So specifically to Orlando, um, we worked with some partners at GreenLink Analytics using their um, equity map tool to, to do some further data diving and mapping of the energy burden landscape here. 
Um, and that is available online for anyone who wants to peruse that. Um, and you know, a few key things that we found that the average energy burden here in our city is 4.3% as of 2019. Um, and that's 1.2 times higher than the national average. Um, so that again, really speaks to uh, you know, the, the costs of utilities versus the size of energy bills here in our community. Um, and we have that broken down into kind of two stratas. So that high energy burden, that is 6% or higher um, of your uh, percent of income that's spent on utility bills. Um, and then once it's 10% or higher, it kicks into that severe energy burden category. And when we're looking at this across um, those race demographics of our city, um, there's a pretty direct inverse relationship in terms of uh, the communities that are predominantly Black and Hispanic um, and communities of color within Orlando and those that are facing those high to severe levels of energy burden. So um, you can see from these graphs in the, the areas where it's lighter, those are our communities of color. And then in the purple map, you can see the darker areas that represent a higher level of burden um, is, is almost uh, directly correlated. And so Cliff touched on a lot of this um, in terms of both the kind of individual and community level impacts around building performance standards um, and considering what those, those implications are to drive greater equity, what are the, the current inequities that we need, we need to and should address through any types of additional policies. Um, and here in Florida, one that is certainly front of mind is really thinking about um, that tension between uh, mitigation and, and, and mitigation for climate change, reducing emissions, and then adaptation and, and understanding and responding to and preparing for the impacts that we're already seeing manifest in our communities. And certainly down here, that means heat. Um, it's always been hot, it's always been humid, um, but the, the data continues to trend into these, these record-breaking uh, months, years, stretches of time um, that have severe implications when it comes to public health um, and how we're, we're approaching even emergency management um, and thinking about resilience. And so um, energy access and affordability uh, really intersects with, with how we're designing um, our response to these, these climate stressors we're already facing today. And so as we've embarked on this um, policy exploration process about how to build on our current benchmarking ordinance, um, we wanted that to be inclusive and representative of community voices and making sure that this policy is affecting um, the types of change that we want, not just from that climate perspective. Um, so what does it mean to be community-led and co-designed? Um, for us here in the city of Orlando, this has looked like uh, just really approaching the policy design process um, almost backwards from, from the way we used to. So rather than identifying the solution, um, designing it, getting feedback, or in some cases implementing it and then getting feedback, um, we're gathering that input up front to actually inform the solutions that are best suited to deliver the outcomes that our community is vocalizing that they want and need. A guiding rubric that we've been using throughout that process is the spectrum of community engagement. Um, and so in spring of 2021, we launched a new collaborative effort in partnership with IMT um, to recruit some community-based organizations that would support community engagement and outreach efforts to educate around a building performance standard um, and then collect uh, insight around both that as a potential um, tool to use to advance energy efficiency um, and climate protection in our community, as well as just to hear more broadly about what energy access and affordability issues um, our community members are facing. You know, what is front of mind for residents and what are their, um, their, their greatest needs and their most poignant concerns. Um, and so as part of our kickoff, um, after we um, partnered on an RFP process to uh, identify those community-based organizations that would, would be our partners in this effort, um, we did a little exercise to assess where those community members thought uh, the city fell in terms of uh, engagement on the spectrum. Uh, and then the city staff that were part of the project, uh, we, we kind of self-evaluated. 
Um, and spoiler alert, that self-assessment does not equal self-awareness. Um, probably unsurprising to, to most, um, the community-based organization really put us between a zero and a one um, in terms of where we were falling. So that was in the ignore to inform um, stages. So, uh, you know, pretty, pretty uh, definitive uh, perception in terms of the level to which the community was feeling engaged and involved in um, program and policy design. Whereas our city staff um, saw us more in the three to four range, um, which is more in that include and involve. Um, but I think that key distinction was the stage at which that involvement was happening and the degree to which that input was actually going to influence um, what was being considered, proposed, or implemented. And so we've really had to kind of redefine, you know, what do we mean by community? What do we mean by engagement and involvement? Who is considered a stakeholder and why is that really representative of who we want and need it to be um, as we try to um, be more collaborative in, in this process? So these CBO partners um, kind of did a, a variety of different outreach efforts that again, I am happy to share more detail offline when there's more time, um, but, but various different forums and, and mechanisms, mediums for collecting some community input, um, and then summarize them into some key findings and re recommendations that they presented to our mayor and senior leadership earlier this year. Um, and some of those key themes were definitely around, um, you know, accountability of um, the policy, how it would be enforced, who would be impacted, who might be left behind, um, tenant um, concerns about the, the rising cost of rent and if that would be a consequence of a potential policy, um, and just any types of other type of retaliation or implications um, that they might face as a tenant. Um, and just getting more involved in the process. Um, that was, you know, sort of the, the, the resounding feedback is we want more of this. We want more opportunity um, to voice our concerns and, tr and, feel, and tr feel, feel truly heard. Um, so some of those recommendations then really dovetailed with centering energy burden as, as our focus for how we would approach um, policy or program design, that centering that um, is, is really what they wanted to see us um, us do in our continued efforts. And so that then launched a, a data um, analysis effort that built on that existing energy burden study. So we, we continued our work with GreenLink um, to do a deeper building stock analysis. Um, and whereas some of that um, in, in previous iterations really focused on um, that building stock to optimize emissions reduction um, by uh, by way of those recommendations, now that focus was on, um, you know, that, that human-centered piece. So what does the building stock landscape look like um, alongside these, these burden qualities that we understand now and where they're most concentrated in our community? And how can we optimize a policy um, to, to most greatly mitigate um, that energy burden and provide relief to our residents? And more or less, um, you know, what that revealed is that if we were to um, build on our current benchmarking policy um, by incorporating a performance standard, um, but keeping that general building scope threshold intact, um, which as a reminder was 50,000 square feet for private commercial and multifamily buildings, um, that that would largely to not at all affect energy burden as most of the multifamily buildings within those communities um, living in those condi conditions fall around the 30,000 square foot level or less. Um, so really needing to focus on those smaller multifamily buildings um, in how we design a policy is how we're going to best address actually um, reducing energy burden. And given that we already knew that that burden was again concentrated in communities of color throughout our city um, just kind of reinforced that again, those vulnerable populations that have been historically disinvested um, would continue to kind of see that same um, lack of benefit from, from a policy that's implemented, even if it drives a, a, a great degree of emissions reduction, um, it wouldn't have that impact on, um, on that personal level for how we're actually driving greater equity in our built environment. So where we are right now, um, we're, we're kind of wrapping up that phase one and just entered into phase 2A. Last month, we kicked off an internal energy burden task force, and we're also a member of the White House coalition that Cliff had mentioned. 
Um, this is an interdepartmental task force to really get um, city officials that work in some degree on um, the built environment. So that's everything from planning to emergency management to housing and community development, community affairs, um, and some other representatives from other departments across our city um, to understand this issue, understand the scope and scale of it, um, get familiar with some of the, 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 the nuances I've shared today, um, which is just the surface of it. Um, and start to think about, okay, what are the additional um, resources that we need to develop or implement? Are there existing programs we could optimize in some way to better target those households that are um, facing those high, high levels of burden? Um, and then we'll embark um, next year on an external version of that. So again, weaving in more community members through some of our existing forums, as well as additional forums outright. Um, and then at that point, we hope to have um, some different insights and recommendations from across these different groups um, that then we can can parlay it to the community further and get that input on. So the, the hope is to still work towards that building performance standard, um, but really think critically about how we structure that. So it's driving, um, driving those equity impacts as much as it's thinking about um, emissions as, as this, this um, important metric. And so with that, I think I'll be transitioning it over back over to Barry to introduce our next speaker.